Here we go. Here Kelsey we go. Grant, one of my favorite people. Welcome to the <laughs> podcast. Thank you, friend. I'm excited to be back. You. This is your third time? Second time? I know you've been on sure. twice. I know, I know we've been on at least once. I remember recording an episode on my kitchen, not on my kitchen table, at my kitchen. <laughs> it was a wild one. It was wild, friends. Wild. Um, and I know we did that one. I don't know if we did another one. We did one where I had you come into a group coaching container oh, and answer yeah, questions. Yeah. And then I just put that one up online too. Okay. But that original one, I think you were the third or second podcast mm-hmm. episode that I ever recorded. I think mm-hmm. you're number two, actually. Yeah. It's yeah. it's early. It's early, early, early. Because I had Mark Groves at his house in which I knew nothing and he had to kind of guide me and hold my hand. And then I had you at your kitchen table. Yeah. But you're back. And now I've and done then- like 170 episodes. And so I'm super professional now. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Oh, it's so good. Because, you know, practice makes perfect. You know, eventually we get there. <laughs> and also like what is perfection? Like, I'm, I'm not really like into perfection anyway. Like, I like the realness. I like the messiness. I like the, well, let's just figure it out and like do the thing versus like getting stuck in this mental paralysis of like, it needs to be perfect before I do anything sort of jam. So I love, I love that you're this many episodes in. That's incredible. Yeah. And you're in the right place. If you do not seek perfectionism, <laughs> let me just assure you. <laughs> so maybe we can just start there. I know we have a big, juicy topic to dive into related to masculine and feminine integrity. Mm-hmm. But while we're on the perfectionist train, do you see that in clients often? Actually, hang on. Stop. Rewind. <laughs> For people that don't know who Kelsey Grant is. Oh, yeah, we better <laughs> tell them. <laughs> can we can you do just like a really quick? What's your deal? Mm hmm. Yeah, I definitely can. So I guess the easiest way to kind of sum up what I do is I'm a modern day mystic who focuses on love and relationships. And I have a school where I teach embodied relating and embodied loving. And the there's a path to that work. I'm also a musician and a songwriter and a singer who writes songs about love and relationships and has a lot of fun doing that. And uh, I love spaghetti. I just, I love spaghetti so much. It's my favorite thing. I was on Vanessa and Danae's podcast last week and they're like, what's your favorite food? I'm like, I need to pick two because I can't decide. And so it was spaghetti and mashed potatoes, not together, like separate experiences, but like, those are my top two fave foods. And that's really like, if you need to know anything about me, like that's what you need to know. Like, I, I'm shocked that you did not mention magic, glitter, wands, <laughs> or casting spells while well, divining things from the ether. I mean, that is also very much me. And I think that's where like the modern day mystic, like it's now like the thing that kind of covers all of that terrain because yes, I'm obsessed with glitter, with ribbon wands, casting spells, um, all my witchy ways. Like those things bring me a lot of joy as well. Yes. Okay. So you're like a love and relationship person. You're on Instagram, I know, at Radical Self Love. You can follow her if you're listening. And you work with a lot of people, primarily women, I believe, mm-hmm. yep. to help them navigate themselves and their lives and their love lives. And so while we're on the topic of perfectionism, mm-hmm. I'm sure that you come across that topic. What does it mean? Why does it happen? What do we do about it? Mm. You say on that? I mean, that's that's a very big question. I mean to me, like what perfectionism is, is like this pattern that we run that ultimately like pinches us off. It like closes off our energy, um, sort of like a protection mechanism in a lot of ways so that we don't have to open to the more vulnerable territory of being really intimately connected with ourselves and with other people. 
is to be connected to ourselves in those ways might mean that we have to touch a part of ourselves that feels really tender about maybe not being good enough or a part that, you know, is really insecure or, you know, parts of us that we like to just cast into the shadows and we're like, that doesn't belong to me. Like, that doesn't exist. And so perfectionism is, is really like tightly wound energetically. And so when we run something like that, it takes a lot of our mental and emotional focus. So we can just focus on that thing and it distracts us <laughs> from like, having to go through those more subtle layers of what it means to be human. And like, ultimately, all of us want to, well, I don't want to say everyone on the planet wants this, but I'd say that the majority of people on this planet want to be loved and want to love, you know, it's, it's not a (laughs) really like wild assumption to think that that's what the majority of people are really after in this lifetime. But like when we run a pattern of perfectionism, it's this interference that blocks the reception of love, but also blocks your ability to really give love cleanly and be in connection in a really clean way. So I think the reason that it happens is because we're human and, (laughs) and we learn these things from the people around us and the people who have mentored us and our parents and our caregivers and the world around us really values you know, perfectionism, which is kind of this distorted masculine ideal. Um, And we've just like cranked it to level hundred (laughs) on the planet right now. We're like, this is the only way that you get love, value, belonging is if you are perfect. When the actual truth of it is you get way more love and belonging when you're real Like I have been in communities where like that perfectionism is running and that idea that we all have to be perfect and perfectly curated to belong here. And I do not feel a sense of belonging there. It feels like walking on eggshells in those communities versus a community like ours where we're all just beautiful messes. And we're like fumbling through life, just trying to figure it out. And there's this rich sense of community and connection because we can see ourselves in one another's imperfections. And our community has this, you know, baseline of approval. Like we just have a lot of approval for each other and approval for our humanity, which makes it a lot easier to be an acceptance when someone makes a mistake or when we don't get it quite right or when it looks a little messy. And uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, really just normal human gauntlet that we all have to walk through. I think it's like one of the biggest initiations into like settling into the truth of who you are is walking that gauntlet of perfectionism and figuring out that that's not it. You know, we often learn what something is by diving into what it isn't first. And when we like learn what it isn't, it gives us so much clarity to what it actually is to belong. And when we really like settle into like who we are, it's, there's just so much more room. Like <laughs> when we're in perfectionism, like you have to be so tightly wound to maintain that. And like, there's just not a lot of room for the fullness of your human to do what the fullness of your human wants to do, you know, and be in your fullest, truest expression. So I think it's just a very normal thing for people to struggle with. Um, The world that we live in really like gives a lot of messages of like, you will only belong if you're perfect. And like, this is the way that you need to maintain that perfection. And if you don't, then you're an outcast. And so we do that for a while until we realize like, this didn't take me to like the treasure at the end of the rainbow here. Like, where's the prize? And it's in that moment, it's so sobering that we're like, wait, maybe like this whole like thing that I just did of like manufacturing my life 
in a way that isn't really true for me. Maybe that was the thing that was leading me to understand what the deeper, truer thing is for me and my expression. And can I have more permission for my human and the direction that I want my life to really go? And do I want to be with people who are like tightly wound and like there's no room for mistakes? Or do I want to be with people who make mistakes and they know how to make it right? And, you know, there's just more approval for the fullness of our humanity. Like I know which camp I would rather play in. Well, you're in that camp. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't always in that camp. Like so you, I had you, to. Are you a recovering uh, perfectionist, would you say? Well, like I have a lot of over-functioning tendencies. So over-functioning and perfectionism kind of just love to dance it out on the dance floor together. So there is a lot that, and coming from a performance background where I was in show choirs and like there is a certain way that you need to sing the music or perform the choreography. Like you couldn't do like a lazy jazz hand. Like that was unacceptable. Like it was like full on like energy out, like the tips of every single finger. Like there's no like bend to your hands. Like it is full on all the time. <laughs> Lazy jazz hands is a great band name. I want you to consider that as you move forward in your music career. Okay. Okay. I will, I'll run it past Corey. I don't know that he'll be on board since we, neither of us do jazz in any way, shape or form. Okay. But so you were, you were raised in a, in an environment in which perfectionism was the goal and the process of seeking that perfection was rewarded. That was uh, what connected you to other people in your life. That's what got you praised. That, that is what got you belonging. Was there a moment where you broke out of that or was there a slow mm. transition away from that experience or was it an epiphany it, one day? I don't know if it was an epiphany more so like it, it feels like in my body like this moment of like I just can't take it anymore. It was one of those kind of moments where like everything just came to a head. I got kicked out of my house when I was 17. I stopped really doing a lot of uh, show choir performance stuff. I like, quit all of the choirs that I was a part of and like went on like this three to four year journey of kind of bumbling in the dark, of, like not really knowing what I was doing, who I was, but I just knew that I was like in resistance to a lot of the things that were, if they felt like constraints in my system, like I can't quite do this anymore. It feels like a straight jacket and I need to like get this off. And I'm the type of person that will do things in a more explosive way, especially like in that phase of my life. Like it wasn't like this subtle, like I can just like make a choice that's different. Uh, <laughs> I, I needed like the explosion and like the intensity so that I would maintain it. Like I almost had to like blow up any semblance of my life before <clears throat> so that there was no temptation to go back. And now 20 some years later, I don't have to move in such a, an extractive or like explosive way. Now I can just pivot when I find like, oh, we're in that like straight jacket moment again, like we've built something that isn't the true thing anymore, or we're somewhere that like, it's just, it's not quite the right thing anymore. And so now we pivot and I can do that in a much more relational way now <laughs> after learning how to not do it. You know, it took a lot of repair on many relationships, like mostly in my family system to kind of get those things back on track uh, because of the explosive nature in which like I kind of broke free of <laughs> the constraints. And to be fair, like 
there was this interesting thing that happened in my family system where there were certain areas where there was a lot of permission to be myself. And then there was these other places where perfectionism was really like hammered home. Like there was a lot of structure and there was not a lot of like weaning from that structure and like getting out of it. So like by the time I turned 17, I'm fucking exhausted and I'm irritated and I have all of these hormones like pumping through my system as an adolescent girl. And I'm like, don't fucking tell me what to do. That's like literally like my shadows, like favorite go-to phrase is like, don't fucking tell me what to do. And that just all came out and I'm like, I'm just going to like really go for it and like not leave a pathway back to where I've kind of come from in the sense that I'm not going to let myself collapse back into those patterns without even knowing at the time that that's what I was doing. But, you know, 20 some years later, I look back, I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I was doing. And it gets a, it's a part of individuation. Did I have to do it in such an explosive um, way? Well, I guess, yeah, because that's how I did it. But like, <laughs> there are other options as well, everybody. Yeah. And to be fair, though, at the time, you didn't have the full toolkit, right? You mm -hmm. probably just had the sledgehammer. Yeah, so I had I no, get out of here. totally no tools exactly but the sledgehammer and like just got to break shit get out and maybe there will be something on the other side which yeah i picture just 17 year old you with the sledgehammer breaking a hole through the house wall and then now you looking back being like yo there's a door like yeah here's the doorknob why did yeah. you why did you do that? And everybody yeah. else around you is in chaos and saying that you're destroying the home and like, just, and you're like, no, I'm I gotta not. Get out. I got to get out of here. This comfortable jacket that I've been wearing now feels like a straight jacket. And mm -hmm. in that moment, panic ensues and you're perhaps not thinking as logically and rationally and slowly as you are now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have to just follow up. Was there a specific incident or that you got kicked out of the home at 17 that's that seems like a big deal mm -hmm. and I didn't even yeah. know that I've been friends with you for years and I didn't know that story yeah um I mean there was this a lot of me. this is just me forgetting that I'm actually hosting a podcast and <laughs> just pretending that we're having a chat having dinner <laughs> like what happened what did you do uh well there was a lot happening in my family system at that time like my parents they were in their own like chaos bubble with each other. And, you know, at the time, like therapy wasn't super normalized. Um, we definitely didn't have resources of personal development, relational development, like we do now. The internet was just starting to be a thing. Like that's how old I am. Like, and so like, you couldn't just go on Google. I don't even think Google existed. And <laughs> Like you couldn't go on Google and be like, my marriage is falling apart. What do I do? <laughs> Whose voice is that? I don't know. <laughs> my marriage is. <laughs> yeah. So you lacked support. You lacked knowledge. You lacked mm. opportunities, options. And you were doing the best that you could in a chaotic environment with the yeah. sledgehammer that you knew and loved. Yeah. And. There, I was in a relationship with this guy that really kind of set the tone for like the, the rest of my love stories, which that's like a whole fucking book in itself. But I was in this relationship with this guy who was older than me, who I was just like enamored with. And I was like, I'm probably going to have sex with this person. So I probably should go on birth control and be responsible like there were again like there were parts of me that were like really mature and like responsible and then other parts that were just a wrecking ball and <clears throat> so I went to my mom and I was like listen like this is just the reality and I want to be honest with you about what I'm considering doing and she was like okay I will take you 
uh, to your doctor's appointment for this. I'm like, okay, great. Like, and then <clears throat> during the day, cause my doctor's appointment was after school and my partner at the time had messaged me and he was like, listen, I can drive you from school to your doctor's appointment. So your mom doesn't have to leave work as early and she can just meet you there if that would be easier. Me thinking like, that's a very considerate thing. Like she already has to take time off of work to do this. And she doesn't have to take as much time off of work. And <clears throat> like, she can still be there for me. So I call her and let her know this and she flips. And she's like, all you care about is him. Fine, let him fucking take you. I'm not gonna be there. And so she didn't come and like, he didn't go into the appointment with me. So now I'm like terrified because this is like a big thing. And I go in, have the appointment, get the birth control. Also like for the record, like the pill doesn't just start like the day you take the first one, which no one informed me of this. And like, I'm very blessed that I did not get pregnant like because of this foolish mistake, but so like I get the pill, then the agreement was that I was going to his parents for dinner that night, which I had to clear with my mom because we had a lot of rules in our house. And like, I, my life was so scheduled that I couldn't just like do whatever I wanted. A lot of the things I did had to be cleared by my mom. So I had asked her if it was okay, if I could go to his house for dinner and then he would take me to my music lesson that night. And I'd cleared that like a week in advance. And she had said yes. So I'm like, well, I guess after this appointment, we'll just go to his place. And I was like, you know what? This is a good day to have sex for the first time. This like really traumatic thing just happened. So let's have sex for the first time. So we did before his parents got home. And... Then right after we'd finished having sex, all of a sudden, like there's this banging on the door, like the phone's ringing like crazy. I look downstairs and it's my dad at the front door raging. What is going on? And so we don't answer the door. We just like pretend like we're not there. And <clears throat> then eventually like I call home later like after we've had dinner with his parents and I've calmed down my nervous system is somewhat settled and my parents are like you know we don't know where you are and like how dare you like go to his house and like not clear this with us and like it was a mess and I'm so confused because my mom actually knows where I've been and what I've been doing but I don't know like why my dad's exploding the way that he is so I tell them I'm not going to my music lesson because I don't feel safe. Like I, I don't feel safe around my dad behaving this way. And I know he'll be there and like, it's terrifying. And my boyfriend's parents said I could stay the night in their guest room. And so that's what I was going to do. And obviously my parents were very angry about that. And then the next day when I went home, when I went home, they had changed all the locks and they were like, you are not welcome here. You don't live here anymore. And like it took, I think it was like a year, maybe two years later. It must have been two, maybe two and a half years later, because my parents were separated and getting divorced at this point, where I went out for dinner with my dad and he's like, I really want to apologize to you for what happened. And I'm like, okay, can you just like give me like the snapshot of like, what happened there? Cause I'm still confused. Like how we went from zero to a hundred, like when I did everything right. So like tying that perfectionism back of like, I followed the rules. Like I did everything that was outlined in our household that has me not get into trouble. And not only do I get into trouble, but I also get kicked out of the house and literally have nowhere to live as a 17 year old. And like, Luckily, my boyfriend's parents at the time were like, this is kind of fucked up, but like, yeah, you can live with us, but you're paying rent. So I had to pay rent to my boyfriend's parents to stay there, but at least I had a place to live. And when my dad and I had this conversation, he was like, well, I came home from work 
we were having dinner and I asked your mom where you were. And she said she had no idea where you were, but all she knew is that you went and got birth control that day. And he's like, and something in me just snapped. And I'm like, well, that kind of makes sense. (laughs) And, you know, she didn't tell the truth. She knew where I was and she knew that if she said that she didn't know and that she knew that I got birth control, that it would set my dad off. And like, essentially like he would play out the thing that she was feeling inside because she was really hurt and angry that, and made up the story that I didn't want her to be there for this like big moment, which was not actually the truth. And her and I unwound that, but like not till like a decade later, like her and I, it was a much slower process to our like rekindling our relationship. It's only been in the last 12 years that we have really repaired. And now her and I are like super tight and like super close. She's in my container. She does this relational work. It's so fucking rad to see like the shit storm that we came from and like where we've landed now. But uh, that's essentially the story of how I got kicked out of the house and like the things that really shaped so much of my undoing that ultimately became like the fertile ground for like the truest expression of me to grow and to come through. Thank you for sharing so openly Mm -hmm. and vulnerably. I'm glad I asked that question selfishly. Now you know. And so does everybody else. (laughs) So does thousands of people on the internet. (laughs) Do you talk about that story much? I haven't heard it or like haven't seen it written about like. No, I mean, I I definitely have talked about it. Um, But I, I don't know. I don't know where I might have written that or probably what happens is it gets shared in like my coaching containers. Um, but I don't know if I've shared that publicly before in this type of forum. Maybe I haven't. Well, maybe, maybe this is the first time. Thanks for sharing your secrets. You're welcome. <laughs> also, I'm conscious that it's now been like 27 minutes and we haven't even begun to touch the topic that I invited you to come on and talk about. And so I'm trying to find a way to transition. to <laughs> but I I don't know how to transition into it so maybe I'll just maybe this is the transition and I'll just ask you about integrity okay hey Kelsey Grant we really should have just had two podcasts one about perfectionism and one about integrity but hey nobody's perfect right exactly like it's actually it's actually perfect how we just made that transition I mean, there is a difference between like innate perfection and perfectionism. Like innate perfection is just like what happens in reality when we just allow reality to move us. And that's just the current that we've just been moved into, which is great. Are you suggesting then that reality is always perfect no matter what is happening? Well, not in the sense of like the idea that perfection means like sunshine and lollipops like right that's not what I mean um I mean like perfection in the sense of like well this is what's happening and like if we really surrender into life and like this does not include things that are abusive like that's a whole different conversation and I think that's where people get really fucked up because they're like oh so you're saying that when I got raped or when I got abused or like when I was living in a war-torn country, that that's perfect. No, we're talking about like your (laughs) day-to-day. When what happens in your reality is actually in service to who you're becoming. And like, depending on your spiritual beliefs, like we could take, you know, a spiritual perspective, like 10 steps out that might lead you to like oh okay I can see how that experience while it was really harmful and really painful and like really terrible ultimately shaped me into the person that I've become do I think that that experience was perfect no but do I see the innate perfection of how like I've chosen out of my own free will 
to carve this path of who I am based on the things that have happened. And like, I'm not going to become, you know, the thing that harmed me. Like there is a lot of innate perfection in that when people like choose to like come back to their power, especially after something truly atrocious has happened to them. And that's like the, the thread of perfection that, you know, the mind will really have a hard time with this <laughs> and it's like, cause it's more of like an energetic, emotional, spiritual layer, like the mind in its linear logic and it's like very black and white thinking will have a hard time really digesting that, which is why we need to get into the body, which is why we need to you know, get the mind in relationship with the body and the emotions in relationship with the mind so that we're not getting railed by our mind 24 seven. And uh, <laughs> we can really like find this more balanced embodied space to go through our humanity and our human experiences yeah and i think that's why you and kendra adachi are pals because of what you just mm -hmm. stated there mm -hmm. the dropping into the body feminine wisdom mm -hmm. etc and on that note if i may transition to a conversation i had with kendra adachi that i mm -hmm. think actually might i think this actually is working to get us where we want to go perfect one of the one of the sticking points or how do you call it a recurring conversation that we have had mm -hmm. not in a bad way not in a good way it's just a difference of opinion and a different of different ways of seeing the world is this idea of and i see this often on social media in particular that you can just change your mind about a commitment about an obligation etc about plans and then just say well i'm not feeling it it's a no to me i just felt into my body and that's my truth right and so i'm intrigued by the relationship between my truth and my integrity in particular the way that i keep my word in the way that my values align with my actions in the way that I do the thing that I say I'm going to do while at the same time honoring and recognizing that there is something deeper and perhaps more profound inside of me that can change over time. Mm -hmm. And so do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> yeah, this is a really, you know, complex, very sticky terrain. And I think it's clunky because like, and I hate that I'm going to say this, but like in this patriarchal system that we're currently plugged into, like the idea of integrity has been more of a masculine one, which is you do what you say you're going to do by when you say you're going to do it, your word is your bond. Amen. Right? Amen. And we all know in a patriarchal system that there is not a balance of masculine and feminine values. So the feminine value is the internal, it's the slow, it's the mess, it's the mystery, um, it's the feeling, it's the emotion, it's also the changeability. So in this current juncture that we're in is we're trying to like level things out because that's really what I see is kind of the way through. We're not essentially gonna like tear the patriarchy down like it's about building a new system that is more balanced in terms of these two energetics so it's not just one dominating the other because the feminine dominating the masculine would be just as problematic it would just be different problems but like the avenue through is like finding the balance between this more masculine energetic of you know, we have to have forward movement. We have to <laughs> be able to initiate and like move forward and take action and have structure. But we also need to value just as much the time for the pause, you know, the ability to go internal and like really feel into what's true. So I think in this particular juncture, as we're trying to like make this transition, it's clunky. 
because we feel like, oh, we've been starving this one part, this more feminine energetic part. And so the ego can kind of get a hold of that and be like, well, I'm just going to do that all the time. And I'm going to be like a tumbleweed. And like, I'm just like floating in the wind and like, no one can tie me down. And like, I just feel this way. And it's just the truth, you know? And so we almost have to like swing to this extreme for a lot of people. They will need to swing to the extreme to like, just get it in their system. And then eventually it does level out because when you have the masculine integrity, which is, you know, your word is your bond. Then you have your feminine integrity, which is I follow what's true. And I, I go with the path that's most true. And that can be a a very changeable experience. And where this like really does a lot of relational damage is, and both sides can do the relational damage here. It's not just, you know, the whimsical, you know, feminine side, which is just like, that doesn't feel true to me anymore. Like I'm not doing that. That's more of a collapsed energy. (laughs) And where like we really find the power is being able to pause and really consider what we're committing to before we commit to it. This is how we like merge them together, in my opinion, is like we have to pause. And like sometimes that might mean like taking 24, 48 hours before you give your word so that you can really feel it all the way through. Like, is this commitment actually the true thing for me and if it is like it's so easy to like follow through on that and when we don't like when we have this idea of like our word is our bond and then like last minute we change our minds once or twice that's not going to be a problem relationally because we all understand that you know people get sick um you know things happen in life. And we have to have that flexibility of like, okay, you know, I get it. But when it becomes a habit of just canceling last minute, that actually breaks a lot of trust and rapport in the relational dynamic. Cause you're training people that you can't be counted on. <laughs> like you're training them that the one thing you can be counted on is that you won't be able to follow through on the things that you say. And that's, that's going to do a lot of relational damage. And so where we can really start to like come into our mature adult self and the mature adult self is the one that can hold the masculine integrity, which is my word is my bond. I'm doing what I say I'm going to do by when I say I'm going to do it. And then the feminine energetic of it, which is, well, I'm going to follow the thread of what's true. And what is in service to my deepest truth and what is really in service to like the deepest opening where there can be the most connection. And when we start to merge those two together, that's the sweet spot, but like, it's going to be clunky for a lot of people, especially if we've been conditioned in this more masculine idea of integrity and like our feminine integrity has literally been starved for our whole life why people have a hard time trusting their intuition because they haven't been in touch with that part of themselves and they demonize that part of themselves they make it wrong and so there is this like period of time where we do have to have a little bit of grace for one another (laughs) it's like it's going to be clunky it's going to be messy as we kind of figure it out but when we notice a pattern in our relationships of like last minute i'm just ejecting like it's just not true for me anymore what could be happening there is like the ego is so crafty and it learns really fast and so when you start introducing new language like new spiritual language new personal development language it learns that really fast and so it will literally latch on to that language And you will think that it's just your truth speaking when it's actually like, it can be like a layer of ego 
that's just like figured out like, oh, this is the thing that I can say that kind of absolves me from like really having to like be in my functional adult is really what it comes down to. And if we're noticing that like there's a trackable pattern there, then maybe we need to take a better look at like, maybe I'm like saying yes to things too fast and I'm not actually taking time to consider, you know, maybe, and this is, you know, for women or people who have periods, like when you are at a certain stage of your cycle, like your capacity will likely be different. I know for me, like if I'm on the week of my bleed, I'm not booking lots of interviews. I'm not booking a lot of social engagements. And does that mean in the moment I have to like face the disappointment of saying no to someone? Yes, it does. But that's way better than dealing with the fallout that happens when I cancel on them last minute because my energy is like really like at the bottom of the barrel. And I already knew that I wouldn't have the energy to do it, but this perfectionism of like wanting to get it right or like wanting to be pleasing or like wanting to not disappoint them has me make the commitment in the first place. So like, it's such a complex thing. <laughs> it's, there's many, many, many layers to unwinding that. Yeah, that was really well said. And I think just Thank as you. backstory for those listening, Kels and I had sushi like a month ago. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were talking about this topic and I invited you to come on. Like, can we just get this out in the air? Because mm -hmm. one thing I was ranting about was this idea that you're not, you're not honoring your truth. You're a flake. You're a bad friend. You are just a tumbleweed, as you said. And the only thing that is consistent about you is your inconsistency. And I don't trust you right? Mm -hmm. As one, and this is not about Kendra Dachi, my partner, mm -hmm. just to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> but this is just about this kind of phenomenon, this clunky yeah. space that we're in that I see online, where I witness people using this honoring of the feminine and this inner truth as a sort of get out of jail free card mm -hmm. for just not doing things that they said they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's rubbed me the wrong way and I haven't really been able to articulate it. Why? Mm -hmm. But I think you just did a good job of that. So thanks for that. You're welcome. Yeah. I mean, it rubs me the wrong way too. Like, and I'm also someone who, like, if something really genuinely doesn't feel right, like I do an investigation on that first. Like, and this is where, you know, the functional adult versus like, the inner child or the teenager, like those younger parts of you will not want to investigate the actual like simmering of truth in your system. Like they just won't, they're just like, I'm entitled. Like, this is just how it is like deal with it, you know, but then your functional adult comes online and I'm going to refer to it as my woman because I am a woman, but like apply to it, like in the context that's right for you. Like, so your functional adult, your man or your woman. And when my woman comes online, she's that mature, graceful, integral presence who understands the impact of my behavior. Because when we are just canceling stuff willy nilly, we're not actually like really touching the impact that that has relationally on the world around us. And we don't care because it's coming from a more entitled place. And this is how you tell the difference. <laughs> because if it's really like my, my embodied woman, who's like, you know what? Like, this just isn't the true thing for me anymore. Not only am I going to have a really brave conversation with the person that it impacts, but I'm already before I drop the bomb on them, I'm already going to have touched what that impact potentially could be. And I will really showcase that in my communication with them of like, I know that this probably means that you think that I'm flaky or that you might be really hurt or that you might not be able to trust me.
going forward because I am breaking this really big agreement with you or this big plan with you. And I want you to know that any feelings you have about that, I can hold. And I'm committed to making it right between the two of us. It's very different than, I just don't feel like doing it anymore. It's just not true for me. You know, and there's just not a lot of responsibility in that when we're acting from that entitled place. I was going to add that we're using the example of keeping plans, Mm -hmm. showing up when you said you're going to show up, but that's only one sort of manifestation of the way this plays out. I think another one, just as an additional example for the listener, may be saying something and using that under the guise of simply, I'm honoring my truth. And Mm. another perspective is, no, you're being a jerk. Like Mm -hmm. you're acting like an asshole, like Mm -hmm. you're rude. You Mm -hmm. lack compassion and empathy. And so this other sort of get out of jail free card that I have been witnessing that rubs me the wrong way. And to your point, makes me pause and consider why it doesn't feel aligned or true in my whole system. Mm -hmm. It's that it's like, oh no, that's just your brat. Yes. This new language and phenomenon that's sweeping through our society and culture Mm -hmm. as a means to behave however the hell you want. And that's Mm -hmm. not okay. Mm -mm. I I wrote a post years ago that got me some shit because I said something like your astrological sign is a scapegoat. Your period is a scapegoat. Your familial system is a scapegoat. Your job is a scapegoat, etc. Basically trying to highlight the point that despite our circumstances, despite our biology, despite everything, we can pause, be considerate, be kind, be compassionate, Mm -hmm. be less judgmental. And to your point, show up as our full human. Yeah. So that's kind of just more context, I think, to those Mm -hmm. listening. Yeah, that I mean, that's such a good point. Because this is like my big beef with radical honesty. Go on. (laughs) Because radical honesty, when not properly understood, becomes this permission slip to be a wrecking ball. And like, I know that that's not how that teaching was originally brought forward, but when you're dealing with humans who distort the fuck out of everything, there's no way that that's not going to get distorted into, oh, well, I can just say whatever I want and like slap this label of like, well, it's just my truth on top of it. And something that I think... I don't know if Elizabeth D'Alto was the first person to say this, but she's definitely the person that said it. And I like, it really went in to my system, but she said something along the lines of truth without love is abusive and love without truth is codependency. Say that again for those (laughs) that had to pull their car over and park and really (laughs) let that land. So truth without love is abusive. And love without truth is codependence. Yeah. And like that's the filter that I kind of use for these types of conversations. Like, yes, this might be like the truth of how a part of me is feeling. Like you said, it might be the bratty part. It might be the entitled part. It might be the bitchy part. It might be like the dominator inside of me. It might be my persecutor. Cause a lot of the time when people are saying it's just my truth, it's actually their inner persecutor who's speaking. And that actually isn't the truth of who you are. It's a, it's a part of you. It's a coping adaptation, but it's not the truth of who you are. Because if you really touch the truth, like in order for me, like the visuals, like touching truth is going all the way to the bottom. And in order to go all the way to the bottom through my system, I have to pass through the heart. 
I have to pass through the heart to go down to touch the truth. But then I also, to bring that truth all the way back up, I have to pass through the gates of the heart again. So I have to pass through the heart twice in order to really touch truth. And that's how you'll know because it won't actually, like, it won't be abusive. Like, I don't want to say like, it won't upset people. Like sometimes when you tell the truth, like it's very upsetting to someone's persona or their ego or certain like egoic identities that they've acquired. Doesn't mean we shouldn't say it, but you really have to be masterful in the way you say these things. Because when you're saying something through that lens of love, but like you're using that sort of truth, like there is so much holding and compassion and love and respect and reverence for the human that you are speaking to. Because you hold that same degree of respect and reverence and love for yourself. And this is the big thing that's missing in a lot of relationships, it's definitely missing on the internet. Um, <laughs> you know, where people are just like, it's just my truth. And like, they're literally abusing each other online. And then they like put on like this righteous persona of like, look how good I am. And like, I'm the superior person because like I spoke my truth and I like called out like all of these like horrible things in someone. But did you do it in a way that was relational? Because if you didn't do it in a way that was relational, first of all, nothing's going to change. And you probably actually just like set in motion more of what you don't want. Because when people aren't met in that relational way, they, their, their protectors come online. They're like, well, what's the fucking point? So I may as well like be even more cruel or more ignorant or <laughs> more hateful because I'm going to get in trouble for it anyway. So I may as well just go full ham on it. And, you know, before we really start like pointing truth at someone else, we better be well-versed at telling the truth on ourselves. Like if you don't have a relationship with telling the truth on yourself and like calling yourself out, and this is that like, goes back to that piece of like, if I'm being flaky and unrelational, I'm just going to be like, oh, I can't do it. Like, I don't feel like it. it's not true. Like, I don't, I don't know. Versus if I'm really telling the truth on myself, I can touch the part of me that's flaky. It can touch the part of me that, you know, just feels entitled and just wants to throw a temper tantrum and like, doesn't want to do the thing because it's hard or because, you know, it's uncomfortable. Versus like when my woman comes on, she's like, yeah, well, sometimes we got to do uncomfortable things. This is just part of being an adult on planet earth. And you can be victimized by that, or you can accept that that's the truth and then actually move through the world with this precision, with this reverence. And like, that's literally like my whole body of work now is literally that whole path to set all of these pieces in motion within someone. You're that's so like, good. Oh, thank you, friend. I, I oftentimes when I communicate with you, mm -hmm. believe that you have somehow traveled into the future, have had the conversation, have written it down memorize the script and then come back and right now just like reciting lines as if you're in a movie like how are you always so eloquent it's it's obnoxious kelsey grant so i mean that lovingly that's my my idea but you reminded me of uh two things first buddy wakefield has this great line that's the first page in my book which is why are we not fighting fire with water compassion will not make us lazy which i love and i love that sort of visual of going down past the heart to your depths, exploring the truth and then coming back through your heart as it goes out. Yes. And second point was one way that I visualize this as just an offering to the listener is this little T truth and then a capital T truth mm. or all capital truth where it might be my little T truth that I don't want to do this thing. 
And that's my brat or my persecutor to use your language. But my capital T, capital truth is like highest integrity, most biggest, best self that's Mm -hmm. like can have those conversations and dialogues and explore those things. And I often will imagine my brain is just like a stadium full of individuals. And that's how my mind works. It's not actually Mm -hmm. just one person with the microphone. It's countless individuals with their own little idiosyncrasy. Idiot, what's the word? Idiosyncrasies? Idiosyncrasies. What is the word? <laughs> I mean, idiosyncratic is like idiosyncrasies. That's idiosyncrasies. it. Idiosyncrasies. I still their can't own, say it. Their own shit. Um, yeah. And then it's like, oh, hang on. My brat's had the microphone for a while now. That's not good. I need to go and take the mic away. Right. Um. So, gosh, I was going to ask you a question at the end of that. I forgot it. Oh, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. You kept using the word relational or non-relational or unrelational. I'm curious, just for those listening, how do you describe that word? What does that mean to you when you say that you need to communicate in a relational manner? Yeah, well, essentially what I mean is like holding relationship as like this ultimate value system. So if I really value my relationships, I'm going to speak in a way that speaks life into that relationship system. So being relational is considering not just yourself (laughs) in your communication. It's about the relationship. It's about you and the other person and the relationship that you are a part of. Because it's like three entities. Like the relationship is its own entity And then you are yourself and they are themselves. So if I'm communicating in a relational way, I'm taking into consideration my needs. I'm taking into consideration that there's a human who feels and breathes and hurts on the other side. And then I'm considering, well, what is in service, like highest service to the relationship that we are building together, whether that is platonic or romantic familial, um, work relationship, like everything's a relationship. So like the fact that we don't pay more attention to our relational worlds is like asinine to me. As Um, an example, when you mentioned a few moments ago that love and truth are interconnected, mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that sometimes you have to have a conversation that is loving and nurturing for the relationship, but for the individual that hears it, they might perceive it as Mm -hmm. an attack or hurtful or mean, Yeah, not loving. Yeah. But in fact, if it's through the gates of the heart with compassion, it's Mm -hmm. like, it's good. Yeah. And the truth of their human will get the medicine from that interaction. But like all of these other layers of the persona, all of the protectors, (laughs) all of the dominators, like all of these parts of us that aren't necessarily the truth of who we are, are going to get whacked. And like, those are like the ego death conversations or like parts of our egoic identity are getting incinerated in those conversations. And it is uncomfortable. Like it's so uncomfortable but it becomes more comfortable when you can touch and name those parts already. Like if you already have a relationship to, and this is where shadow work will come in. Like if I have all of these pieces that are in the shadows, when someone cuts through it, I'm, I'm going to feel really victimized by that. But if I have a relationship to those parts and I'm like, you know what? I know that there's a part of me that's entitled. I know there's a part of me that feels superior. I know there's a part of me that's like this whiny brat. Like, and if I get called out on those things, like when I already have a relationship to them, I can pull a Mark Groves and be like, hmm, can I see the truth in that? And most of the time I can, in which case then I communicate to the other person, I can see some truth in that. I can see some truth in what you're saying. And 
like we have to also be like super sober with ourselves about the fact that just because we think that we're seeing things clearly doesn't mean we always are like every human can see clearly, but also has distortion. And so when we are speaking to a partner, let's say, let's use that example, where they're doing something that is the really impacting you, but also impacting the relationship. And we have to have a really tough conversation about that. You know, parts of their identity are inevitably going to get whacked by that and you know parts of your identity if the tables were turned would get whacked by that but ultimately it's a conversation that's in service to the deepening of the relationship it's in service to the truth of who we all are and if i have this idea that i'm superior that i never distort anything that is very unrelational. There's no movability in that. But if I know that, you know, there might be a part of me that like projected onto you there. <laughs> you know? like, and if I can be responsible for that, you know, and you don't always catch it before it happens. Sometimes you catch it right after, or you don't catch it. And the other person calls you on it and be like, that feels like a lot of projection. And then we have to sit in like this murky soup with each other of like what's distortion, what's projection and what's really truth. And if you don't have a relationship to your emotions, if you don't have a relationship to your body where you can kind of clear a lot of that murky density, you will keep fighting at the surface and never getting down to the minutia of the truth. And that's where a lot of couples are. A lot of couples fight at the surface about stupid shit that doesn't matter. And they're not getting down into the deeper stuff because they don't want to go down and into their body. And you know, part of being a functional adult who is relational is understanding that I might be seeing the truth in my partner. I also might be distorting that a little bit if there is something in me that I'm not totally right with yet. And they're reflecting that to me. I might, there might, it might not be totally clean. And so the process of relationship is like essentially like a constant cleanup of like, we're looking to see like where we did something like really clean, where it was kind of dirty. And then where it was dirty, we bring the cleanup crew and we you know do a cleanup in all five. Like it, that's it, just what relationships are. And if we have this idea of perfection, that everything needs to be perfect and like there's never any mess and there's never any issues, we're going to really struggle in relationships because relationships will take you through the gauntlet of love and the gauntlet of relating and show you where your human is real messy and also show you where your human is really clean and pristine. And like the whole journey of life and love is just getting to know that stuff. And like being more responsible about the parts that you know, might be a little dirty. And then we clean them up as best we can. Some we clean up on our own. Some we clean up in relationship with other people. A lot of the time it's relationship with other people that we do a lot of our cleanup. I love that. And I think it ties back perfectly to the topic at the start of our conversation, which was perfection. Told you and, we'd get there. Oh, God, we're good. <laughs> and here, just realizing that you might have some blind spots or some dirt and some grime and that mm -hmm. you're not this clean and pristine entity who is always right and always truth. <clears throat> Um, so I love that it's tied back to the start. I think that's a good spot to finish. I'm also conscious of time. And I know that you have to go and get into a recording studio today. Yeah, later today. Oh. We got okay. Time. So you have time for some soothing yeah. tea. and I do. Okay. Have some uh, lunch and be nourished. This was such a good conversation, Kelsey mm. Grant. I just <laughs> adore you so much. And you're so eloquent and so wise and so well-spoken 
Mm, And sure that people listening got a lot from that. For those that want more of you, I know that you're on Instagram at Radical Mm -hmm. Self Love. I know you have a website, Mm -hmm. but is there anything that you are desperate to, not desperate, that you want to highlight? (laughs) That you're like, yo, come find me. Yeah, my the path work is what I'm most excited about right now. And there's a couple of different stages to that, depending where you're at on your journey. If this is all very new to you, my emergence container is the place to start. That's where we do the embodiment work and start kind of cleaning out the vessel. I do a lot of beautiful guided alchemical embodiment journeys in that container. And I do a little bit of relational teaching in those ones. And then I have a new container that's opening in the new year called reverence. And this is like the foundation of all of my work. So it's the one container that you got to do before you can do the upper level stuff. And this is where we get into a lot of what we talked about today, the emotional world. And like, also how do we like have right relationship with our emotions and build out this internal reverence for ourselves, for the people that we love and the relationships that we value so much. And then my upper level path is called initiated. It's a two year program. And that's where we do the foundations of relational mastery. So the first year is like all of the mastery modules. And then year two, we really start to flush that out in the embodiment. We do a lot of boundaries work, embodied boundaries, working with desire, a lot of like higher level communication. So it really just depends where you're at on your journey. There's a new program that's after initiated that's sex and leadership, but you know, you have to go through the gates of all of the other ones first. So (laughs) we'll start with those three because those are the ones that literally carve the path for you and give you the tools to navigate this whole relational world with that eloquence, with that grace, um, with that embodiment so that you, know, you can get the most out of your time here as a human and get the most out of your relationships and really build something truly extraordinary and beautiful for yourself. And for those listening, Kelsey Grant is one of the few people in the world that I give my stamp of approval to wholeheartedly, like truly there's a lot of charlatans in this space and a lot of, what do do you call it? Those people that back in the day were selling the snake oil, snake oil, snake oil salesman. There's a lot of charlatans, Mm -hmm. frauds and egos, but you're one of the people that I'm like, yo, go get in Kelsey's world, go learn from her. I trust you. I know you very well and have for years. And so if you're listening this is a this is a conversation and a human and a body of knowledge that I get behind. So I don't know if that means anything to anybody, but I um I mean I have sent people to you in the past. Mm-hmm. I'm like yeah. just go hang out with Kelsey for a year, you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love you. Thank I you so much you. for coming back, and I hope to grab some more sushi with you soon. I'd love that. We'll talk soon.